Well, why don't we uh, get started, given it's uh, 7.01, um, and I know uh, your time is precious, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce a, a, a great friend and a, a mentor, uh, Dipen Parekh. Dipen uh, really is well known to the urologic community. Uh, he did his residency at Vanderbilt and his fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and then started his career at the University of Texas San Antonio, where he, uh, uh, under the mentorship of uh, Ian Thompson, got a uh, an R01 that uh, really was provocative and, and demonstrated uh, very nicely that robotic cystectomy was uh, uh, comparable and in some ways advantageous through the RAZOR trial. And uh, Deben is also, uh, in addition to being the chair at the University of Miami Department of Urology, he's also the chief operating officer, uh, mm -hmm. as well as an executive dean of uh, clinical affairs. So uh, Deben, thanks for joining us this morning and uh, talking to us about optimizing renal function after nephron sparing surgery. Thank you so much, Jim. It's a pleasure of being uh, to be here. Uh, you know, Doug, I know for many, many years. In fact, I was just doing uh, a few robot. I mean, I just started my robotic prostatectomy when I was in San Antonio, uh, and I wanted to learn how to do a cystectomy. And I remember flying up to New York to watch Doug that day. And as luck would have, uh, Doug had two cases, and both those cases got canceled for whatever <laughs> reason. But Doug was extremely kind and actually gave me a live uh, video of a disc on a DVD of uh, one of his previous cystectomies that he had done. So I, I took that, uh, I studied it very well. And then Doug, uh, I've been doing a, a fair amount of cystectomy since then, but I owe it to you for getting me started. So thank you for doing that. My pleasure, and, good to see you. Yeah, and then Jim, of course, uh, I've been great friends with Jim for many years and uh, has always, I've always been, in admiration of all the great work that Jim is doing and has done and is continuing to do in terms of uh, gathering level one evidence on many of the common problems that we face. So without any further ado, I'm going to talk about uh, renal ischemia. So, you know, one common thing, especially when I was getting out of my fellowship at Sloan Catering, uh, people always told you, just only focus on one disease and stuff like that. You know, I've never been able to concentrate on just any one thing. I just want to do things that are fun. And so I just want to tell all the residents, I mean, this talk is mainly for, for the residents and the fellows, is that there are many ways in which you can do your stuff, depending upon what matters to you. And don't let anyone tell you what you can and cannot do. Uh, finding your own pathway uh, in, in academic medicine or in world is one of the most gratifying things. So uh, we just went from a department to an institute now. Uh, courtesy of a very generous donation and have raised about $32 million over the past three years. We are very excited because every single cent that we have raised is going to go into research and education. So today's talk is about renal ischemia. And the bottom line, I know many residents many times have to be pulled up in the middle of a talk and they have to do other things. And if you were to go and do other things, this is the only slide that matters in this talk that when you look at renal function after partial nephrectomy, the baseline quality of the renal parenchyma and post-operative quantity that you leave behind are critical. Renal ischemia, while it is important, it is far more safer than thought earlier. All the surgical modifications that people indulge in, they may be helpful to, the, to them, but they should be balanced by oncologic efficacy and morbidity. And then many people, especially us as surgeons, we ignore the pre and post operative preparation of the patient. And that perhaps could, could be more important than what we do at the time of surgery. So, hmm. okay. So what are the main goals of a partial nephrectomy for kidney cancer? The main goal, the reason you are doing, you're getting that patient on the operating room is oncologic efficacy. You want to achieve cancer control. Some of the secondary goals are to preserve renal function to reduce perioperative morbidity and cosmesis, but you're not doing the surgery for the secondary goals. So if you don't achieve your primary goal, you have actually failed. And so I think many times we focus on all the secondary goals and forget why we are doing the surgery in the first place. So renal function and partial nephrectomy, a fair number of patients with localized kidney cancer uh, who are about to undergo surgery have pre-existing CKD, even with a normal serum creatinine. That have been shown by Bill Wong, and the memorial group many, many years back. And many of these patients undergoing partial nephrectomy will actually have a CKD3 within five years after surgery. It's obviously much more 
give someone as a radical nephrectomy. But everyone agrees that whenever any patient has a decreasing GFR or chronic kidney disease, that's directly correlated with death, cardiovascular events, and hospitalization. So whatever we can do to decrease CKD or chronic kidney disease or acute kidney disease is actually pretty good. Now, with that said, we sometimes get too carried away by our definitions of kidney injury. So if you look at the acute kidney injury world, there are two common classifications that are used, the AKI, Akin classification and the rifle classification. And, and generally that involves an increase in creatinine and a reduction in urine output. With that said though, the acute kidney injury that we see in our patients. So let's say if you do a cystectomy, if Doug has done a cystectomy and the patient is a little behind on fluid and volume uh, on next post-operative day, it's very it's not uncommon to see a mild bump in creatinine. So almost every many patients that we do uh, have stage one or mild acute kidney injury, but that's radically different from someone with endotoxic shock or someone who had a big vascular surgery with aortic clamping and stuff like that, very, very different. That's something to be kept in mind. If you look at in today's day and age, the significance of really stage one acute kidney injury or early stage of rifle for acute kidney injury in the context of patients undergoing partial nephrectomy is completely unknown. Uh, if you were to ask me, 99.9% .9 of these patients just go back to normal. And if you again con contextualize uh, the, the solitary kidney world, or in what percentage of partial nephrectomies we actually really face this challenge, about 3% of all partial nephrectomies that we do in this country today is in the solitary kidney setting. On those, in those patients, about 20% develop acute kidney injury. But remember I told you the stage one AKI does not really matter. And only 23% out of that 20% will end up being on dialysis. So actually, if you sum everything up, less than 1% of a patient population that undergoes partial nephrectomy in today's era are at the risk for a significant, and again, I'm underlining significant acute kidney injury. It's very, very uncommon. However, most of the uh, so-called innovations or research that we try to do in terms of technologic modification is targeting towards this less than 1% of patient population. If you ask me, it's a lot of wasted energy. Now, baseline renal function, the quality of baseline, baseline renal parenchyma sets the ceiling for post-operative recovery. It is a major predictor for post-operative acute renal failure and end-stage renal disease after partial nephrectomy. So if someone is starting at a compromised renal function and takes a significant renal ischemic hit, then that person is likely to undergo a, a diminishing renal function. And it's an independent predictor of decrease in GFR, both in solitary kidneys and in terms of patients with two, not, two functioning kidneys. So that is before the surgery. So that means that's your baseline renal parenchyma. There's nothing much you can do about it. Uh, what about the renal parenchyma volume after partial nephrectomy? So what you had and what you left behind. Now that is also a significant predictor of ultimate global renal function after partial nephrectomy. But as you can imagine, what you leave behind is also dependent upon the volume of parenchyma that you remove. So what you remove and that in turn depends upon how complex your mass is, what the anatomy is, what the location is. And that actually drives the ischemia time more than anything else. And, but it's very, very clearly shown that whatever a healthy renal parenchyma that you can preserve directly translates into a decreased uh, risk of chronic kidney disease. Now, how do you measure renal parenchyma volume after partial nephrectomy? It's typically not done routinely. It's only done for research purposes. You can do it through nuclear scan or a CT scan, or just as a, as a subjective measure visually. Uh, but as I mentioned before, for the most part, what you leave behind is a function of the volume, the size of the tumor and the location of the tumor. So then that leads to the one modifiable factor that we think, that the surgeons think that we are under control and that is renal ischemia. So how reliable is the evidence that limited ischemia is actually not safe. Uh, this is an editorial that I wrote for the EAU a couple of years back where you know, I, we, we challenged uh, of a very flawed thought process over five decades when it comes to the topic of renal ischemia. And it all stems from this article. This is an article published 
by the late Andrew Novick in uh, 1983. Uh, so all five decades back. And if you focus on the article, if you focus here where I've underlined on the right side of the page, uh, second paragraph, it's about canine studies and warm ischemia. They have referenced a referral article of reference number 56. And then they reference a table, table one. So when you actually look back at the table, you see this table, and this table is a very, very simplistic uh, representation of the whole concept of renal ischemia that at, at 30 minutes, uh, you have a functional loss of kidney, but it's completely reversible within three to nine days. And I think more than 30 minutes, uh, you, you're more challenged in terms of not recurring a renal function. So that's a table. The problem with the table is that this table is not found anywhere in a peer reviewed setting. So this article was actually published in the urologic clinics of North America. And as you all know, UCNA is not a peer reviewed uh, journal. It's just basically a, uh, uh, you know, it's a compilation of, uh, of articles and thought processes and stuff like that. But if you really try to trace this table one, it has not been shown in any peer reviewed journal anywhere in the history of medicine. So this table just came in UCNA without any attribution to any scientific work. And that the reference uh, that I mentioned, so if you go back here, reference number 56, uh, and it talks about warm ischemia. So that reference that we mentioned is a paper from 1975 that has nothing to do with warm ischemia. This is that paper that is completely to do with cold ischemia. And this paper talks about uh, renal hypothermia during, during partial or during partial nephrectomy for stones or transplant or any renal ischemic process. And the entire paper is completely focused on hypothermia that has nothing to do with, uh, with warm ischemia times and renal function. So just trying to share that something written in a non-peer-reviewed -peer journal about five decades back has been the gold standard in terms of our field following this whole 30 minute cutoff for regional ischemia time for the next five decades. And that's just something that is just very, very difficult to comprehend. But the way we do things, it's actually not that difficult to comprehend because sometimes we do follow stuff based on who writes it rather than what is written. And so I just want you to, to and if you, if you look at almost any article on renal ischemia, since these, this article has been published, this is the first reference that is cited, attributing this article towards a 30 minutes cutoff for warm ischemia. Now, um, this is a paper that is a co combination study from Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic. Uh, 362 patients, all these patients had only solitary kidney and they underwent partial nephrectomy. And when they looked at all the variables, they did find mom ischemia time as a continuous variable and an independent predictor for adverse renal function. And so they came with a very, very catchy article and a very catchy title that showed that every single minute of mom ischemia time, it adds to the damage and it counts. And they came with a new cutoff of 25 minutes. However, when you look at the exact same cohort of patients, and this is in solitary kidneys, so mind you, even someone, the staunchest critic of this study would submit that it just makes sense, intuitive sense, that if you have one kidney, you want to limit ischemia time to that kidney to the extent possible. So there's no argument in that. However, when they did the exact same study in the exact same cohort of patients, so same authors, same patient population, and then they added the baseline quality of renal parenchyma and the post-operative remnant quantity of the renal parenchyma in the equation, all of a sudden, warm ischemia time did not significantly pan out as, an, as a predictor of renal function. So two years later, they came back and said that every single minute, therefore, does not count uh, of renal ischemia. Now, then what they also did was they expanded the pool, and now they added memorial stone catering in the mix. And now they looked at 660 patients. These are all patients with solitary kidneys undergoing partial nephrectomy. And they again found that the quantity and the quality of remnant renal parenchyma was far more important, and ischemia time was not an independent predictor of ultimate renal function after partial nephrectomy. But this is what actually happened. So if you look over the last, uh, you know, from 1980s to or mid 70s, 80s, and all up to uh, 2010, 
it, it would suggest to you that every minute of renal ischemia counts. However, the problem is that most of the data came from animal studies, renal transplant studies, and retrospective human studies. Now what happens is once you attest or believe in a thought process or, or a principle, and you have written significantly about it, it just becomes impossible for anyone to change their mind on it. And then what ends up happening is that, you know, people who share the same ideology, the same thought process, they combine, and, and this is no criticism. This happens uh, in, in, in every field, uh, not just academic, but everywhere. But then you combine and you start forming uh, consensus. And when, when you form consensus, uh, and, and choose consensus over data, it's a problem. And talking about consensus, I think this is a classic by Margaret Thatcher, uh, the ex prime minister of Britain. A consensus is a process of abandoning all beliefs, principles, values, and policies in search of something in which no one believes, but to which no one objects. The process of avoiding the very issues that have to be solved merely because you cannot get agreement on the way ahead. What great cause would have been fought and won under the banner, I stand for consensus. So anyway, the consensus came about and, uh, and wrote this article on renal ischemia and kidney function after partial nephrectomy a few years back. Again, if you look at the, the authorship, uh, these are extremely strong, uh, accomplished, brilliant surgeons who have written extensively on renal ischemia. The only problem with this group is they only th think uh, it, in terms of ischemia uh, it, as in terms of just an ischemia time, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, pick whatever time you want to pick and use this as a dichotomous marker. But however, even when they looked at this and they studied uh, trying to apply consensus, uh, please focus on the right side. Look at the level of evidence. These are all level three, level four uh, uh, evidence, so very, very weak evidence in terms of uh, the studies or the work that has been done on renal ischemia. You go back again and you see all level three, level four, every single, so they looked at about 30 articles and almost all of them were level three, level four evidences. The only one uh, that was a high level evidence on this subject happened to be a study that we did uh, on prospectively on renal ischemia. And the only reason it's a level two evidence is it's not an RCT. It's a prospective uh, clinical study with some very unique features that I'll get into. Uh, but this is the highest level paper on renal ischemia ever published. There have been randomized trials like the clock trial, but as I'll show you later, uh, even though it's a level one evidence, that trial would have never been allowed to do pursue in the United States. So this is the work that we did when I was in San Antonio. Uh, about the tolerance of human kidney to isolated controlled ischemia. Uh, this is a very simple study. It's 40 patients, all prospectively enrolled. All, at the time, I was doing open partial nephrectomies. So it was a single surgeon. Both these, all these patients had two normal kidneys, uh, uninvolved contralateral kidney. None of these patients had pre-existing end-stage renal disease. And this is a very steady, simple biopsy scheme. So when the patients underwent partial nephrectomy, before we clamped the vessels, as you can see here, and let's say the tumor is here, we took a few biopsies from the renal parenchyma away from the tumor that established the baseline. When we then did the partial nephrectomy, when we clamped the renal hilum, and while we were excising the tumor and doing the reconstruction, we took a biopsy every 10 minutes so that we had, uh, we had renal tissues under varying levels of ischemia time. And then at the end of the partial nephrectomy, when the renal tumor excision and reconstruction was all performed, uh, so let's say if it took 27 minutes to do it, just before we unclamped, or just after we unclamped at 27 minutes, uh, we waited for five minutes for reperfusion injury and again took biopsies. And all these biopsies were then subjected to light and electron microscopy and immunofluorescence. Now, the absolute most unique attributes of this study that makes it super strong is the following. As a surgeon, I was blinded to all the clinical biomarker and structural data till the end of the study. By the way, I should mention that in addition to the biopsy data, we also collected blood and urine uh, in these patients before the partial nephrectomy. And then we also collected the blood and urine 
uh, 24 hours later at eight hours, 12 hours and 24 hours later. And we compared the serum and urine biomarkers before and after the partial nephrectomy. Uh, the key thing is uh, the surgeon has blinded to all the clinical biomarker and structural data till the end of the study. The pathologist and the nephrologist who looked at all the biopsy data and who looked at all the other uh, related data had no idea about the clinical part of the study. So they had no clue what, what type of ischemia did they have. Did they have warm ischemia, cold ischemia? What was the duration of ischemia? They had no idea. And all the serum and urine biomarkers that were evaluated, it was at a lab-based uh, NIDDK certified lab in University of Cincinnati. So they had no idea about any of the other criteria uh, or other variables, clinical variables in the study. Uh, what we did find was that when we looked at the biomarkers, uh, we looked at serum creatinine, we looked at serum cystatin C, which is a much more sensitive biomarker for renal damage. And we looked at EGFR. If you look at the X axis and uh, uh, you have uh, uh, ischemia time at the Y axis, and you have these biomarkers or a change in the biomarkers between pre and 24 hour post-op, there was absolutely no correlation between the duration of ischemia and the change in this biomarker. Also what we did was the, the, uh, the, the, the biopsy material that we did, we had more than 300 biopsies in these patients and we had more than 2000 electron micrographs that were reviewed by subject matter authorities in the field. And then we came out with our own definition where stage zero was a completely normal cell and stage five suggested cell death, as you can see here. And now I'll show you some true pictures but this is a normal proximal renal tubule under, under uh, light microscopy here at the bottom. So you can see the nucleus, you can see all the mitochondria, you can see the nice brush border appearance here uh, at the renal tubule level. And then this is a, uh, uh, an increased magnification where you can actually see the mitochondria. Uh, but we can see here in this patient, so this is the nucleus, that's a mitochondria. But look at this patient with 61 minutes of cold ischemia there is a striking swelling of the mitochondria, with a striking swelling of the cell uh, at this level, at the electron micrograph level. But what is more remarkable is, as soon as there is reperfusion, at five minutes of reperfusion, these mitochondria shrink back from this swollen state immediately and look very similar to the normal state. And the same applies to the, to the actual cell in terms of the nucleus and the brush border appearance. Uh, so when we looked at the electron microscopic injury score uh, and compared it to the duration of ischemia, uh, again, as you see here, there was no correl correlation with the duration of renal ischemia. We subjected all these patients to immunohistochemistry. So actin, integrin, tyrosine, these are all markers of ATP and uh, of ATP generation and energy at the cell level. And as you can see here at the immunohistochemistry level, this is baseline, 31 minutes of warm ischemia and reperfusion at five minutes. We did not see any changes at all in terms of uh, actin and integrin, uh, which, is, which, are, which are the two attributes of the cellular, at the cellular level of the cell wall and the cell membranes. And we saw minimal changes in terms of ATP in the phosphotyrosine levels, and they were also reversible. So when we combine all this, when we looked at the blood and urine samples and we combine all the million biomarkers that we studied, we combine the structural biomarkers, the functional biomarkers, immunofluorescence and the electron microscopy. And we try to do a statistical analysis in any possible way we can. Because remember, I, I did, we did this study in 2008 to 10. And at that time, it was almost, uh, uh, almost criminal in our field to subject patients to, to more ischemia. And for us to, to do this study that has never been done before and see the findings that we have seen the findings that I just shared with you and to show the world that it actually does not matter that all the three or four decades of our thinking was wrong. Even I, as a PI of the study, as someone who designed and did the study was not comfortable with these findings because they just did not fit into the narrative that was in existence for five decades. So we tried to find some correlation, uh, but however, we, we did not find any correlation with the duration of ischemia time. We did find some minimal structural and functional reversible changes. But again, like I said, most of these changes are reversible. They are mild and they're reversible. We again followed these patients up for, for one more year 
after the the study was done and even after a year long period we found that the the duration of ischemia both as a continuous variable and as a dichotomous variable more than 30 less than 30 minutes did not predict ultimate renal function subsequent to that there has been a single surgeon study it's a randomized clinical trial single patient two functional kidneys there is a very nice study from washu and uh, it basically looks at uh, baseline and three month GFR and nuclear scan. It was a well powered study to detect drop in GFR on the patients who underwent a full clamp. And what they found was there was no difference in renal function between the clamp and the non clamp group. Uh, and but what really mattered was the age of the patient uh, and the complexity of the, of the patient, along with the preoperative GFR or the preoperative baseline renal parenchyma or quality of renal parenchyma. Uh, Porpiglia from Europe did a similar study where uh, they did a clamp versus non-clamp technique for partial nephrectomy. As you can imagine, with a non-clamp technique, there was significantly increase in blood loss, but there was no renal functional outcome differences between those who had a full clamp and those with zero ischemia approaches. Uh, this is the clock trial that we are talking about. This is a multi-center study from Italy. All these surgeons are extremely experienced, so all these surgeons had more than 100 uh, partial nephrectomies, either laparoscopic or robotic, that they had done individually. They're, these are all very experienced uh, surgeons. All these patients had a normal renal function, normal contralateral kidney, a renal score of 10 or less, and they were randomized to clamp or no clamp. And uh, we, they looked at the renal scans at baseline and at six months postoperatively. The biggest challenge, though, is in this slide. And this is, again, just speaks to not just this study, but generally when you do clinical trial, it's not just enough to do a randomized clinical trial. It's really important to stick to what you had designed uh, in terms of doing the randomized clinical trial. So in this patient, for example, even though the primary endpoint was renal function in three to six months, they only had to do a poor protocol analysis because this is astounding. 40% of patients who were designated to be on the non-clamp arm, that means they did not had to have clamp, you know, there's a zero ischemia type of a situation, but 40%, almost half of these patients who were supposed to undergo one form of treatment had to be converted to the clamp arm at surgery. And remember, this is in the hands of very experienced surgeons with more than 100 partial nephrectomies under their belt. And then 14% of patients assigned to on clamp were shifted to non clamp just based on surgeon preference. So this is completely gross protocol violation and I suspect that if this study was done at any, any center within the United States, the Data Safety Monitoring Committee uh, or the IRB would have stepped in and shut down the study. Uh, however, even with all these biases, so if you look at baseline, there was a statistically significant increase in those patients who needed a full CLAM, that they were much uh, higher, uh, larger size tumors, they were much more complex tumors, and these patients had significant history of cardiac disease. So even when this group was heavily skewed because of a selection bias, what they found ultimately was that even with all the flaws, there was no difference in kidney function between the two group, groups at six months, and there was no difference in the complication rates. Uh, this is a very, very uh, elegant study that was just recently published, I think this month or last month in European Urology. Uh, what happens to the preserved renal parenchyma after clamped partial nephrectomy? What they did was that those patients who underwent a partial nephrectomy, but later on during follow-up, for whatever reason, had to then undergo a radical nephrectomy for a unilateral recurrence. They basically looked at, once they removed the kidney, they looked at the renal parenchyma and correlated that with the renal functional outcomes. What, this included many centers in China, uh, along with the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, what they did find was this is a review of 147 patients uh, who subsequently had a radical nephrectomy after a partial nephrectomy. And again, this is within what they, what they found again is that a decline in renal function was really mild in those patients who had two kidneys and no baseline chronic kidney disease and was independent of his, uh, histologic changes. But most importantly, the type of ischemia, warm or cold, and the duration of ischemia 25 minutes more or less, yet had absolutely no bearing on the 
renal parenchymal uh, uh, findings uh, after two or three years after partial nephrectomy. So again, there's one more nail in the coffin of the whole renal ischemia uh, house of cards. Uh, this is the Vaticuti uh, database study. So these are 18 high volume centers across the world because people like to speak a lot about ischemia. They say a lot, but what actually do they do? And if you look here, in this about 1,700 patients undergoing partial robotic partial nephrectomy, 96% of these patients undergo warm ischemia or clamp. 18% undergo selective arterial clamping and 13% undergo early clamping. So even though a lot of people like to talk about zero ischemia and off clamp and stuff like that, the reality is that even in the most experienced hands, a uh, majority of these patients undergo a full clamp ischemia. So the take home message for renal ischemia is that limited ischemia is safe to perform partial nephrectomy. Again, the fact to consider here is limited. And as you gain experience, you realize that their ischemia times becomes smaller and smaller. So, uh, you know, if you are doing a complex partial nephrectomy, if you do, if your ischemia time is 38 minutes, that's fine. Because majority of your patients, your ischemia time is actually less than 20 minutes. Most of the partial nephrectomies that we perform inexperienced hands are very, very, they're, they're, they're straightforward in terms of uh, your ischemia time. And if one case takes five minutes longer based on the complexity, that is really not the end of the world. I think it's overly simplistic and naive to consider a single value of ischemia time cutoff to act as a dichotomous marker for renal injury. It just doesn't make sense that at 24 minutes of ischemia, you are fine. And at 26 minutes, you have created or cause irreversible kidney injury. That does not happen. And please always remember the main goal of performing partial nephrectomy is you want to do a safe and sound oncologic procedure. And as you can imagine, it's common sense. If you are doing a surgery in a relatively bloodless field, you'll be able to see what you're cutting in terms of re removal of the tumor. And you'll be able to see what you're reconstructing in terms of the uh, kidney that is left behind. Now, there are people go crazy with the technical modifications of ischemia. There is absolutely no high level data showing any unequivocal benefit of cold over warm ischemia in the partial nephrectomy setting. A lot of studies in the transplant literature of the benefits of hypothermia, but nothing in the partial nephrectomy era. Uh, temperature and the techniques, they remain dependent upon the institution and the surgeon. And you'll see all these articles that keep coming. They, they, there's a lot written on them over the last two decades about early unclamping, off clamp, selective clamping, zero ischemia, all these things are just uh, simply said, not necessary. Uh, the technical modifications, how much of a margin do you really need? Uh, there's enough evidence to show that one cell layer of a negative margin is enough. Uh, if you do enucleation, that's good enough compared to leaving a, behind a, a big margin. Uh, people get obsessed again with the non renography technique, uh, thinking that the sutures that you take uh, in terms of uh, closing the kidney defect will create diminishing in renal function. Again, there's zero benefit in terms of doing any of these crazy maneuvers. Now there is benefit in terms of following some of these preventive measures. So just doing simple things like identifying proteinuria, correcting high blood pressure, reduce, uh, 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 you know, and sending a patient to a nephrologist in terms of optimizing what you what can be optimized is a significant plus. Uh, many studies now have shown unequivocally that all these renal protective agents like mannitol, Lasix, et cetera, has, does not have any high level evidence of showing any benefit. This is a simple study uh, of about 40,000 patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And the mortality of the patients, of these patients is directly linked to the number of visits that they uh, make to the nephrologist. That means, if they go to their nephrologist, if they control their proteinuria, their high blood pressure, their diet, the simple things, and they regularly follow up with a nephrologist, their risk of death is significantly lower. So just these simple things will actually move the needle much more than doing the crazy, uh, uh, you know, zero ischemia stuff for the 15, 20 minutes in the operating room. So my take home message is that baseline quality and post-operative quantity of renal parenchyma is critical. I think renal ischemia is much safer than earlier thought. Again, do not take this to the extreme. No one is saying that clamp the kidney, go get a cup of coffee, come back, and like nothing happens. 
ischemia does matter, but it doesn't matter to the extent that we had earlier thought. I think surgical modifications and making things crazy, uh, they may be helpful in, in people's minds, but even if you think that they are helpful, it has to be balanced by oncologic efficacy and morbidity. And I think the pre and post operative preparation of the patient actually more important. And this is my, my last slide. Uh, uh, you know, I did the ischemia study in 2008 to 10, published it in the, uh, around 11, 12. And because it went against the narrative uh, for, for four or five decades, uh, there was a lot of heat that I took for, uh, for the study and the findings of the study. And there's just nothing you can do about it. You just have to, it just, again, this is mainly for the residents and the fellows that, uh, you know, when we do research, when we are in academics and, uh, you know, first of all, it's always good to do research with an open mind. Uh, and if you, if you, if the findings of your research are such that it fits in the existing narrative, well, I think that's fine. But if the findings of the, research as such, that it it significantly goes against the narrative. I think it's our responsibility to just share the data the way it is and just be open-minded. Uh, that's the reason why we all came into academics in the first place, um, that we keep an open mind um, and we try to study things that, that seem interesting to us and then just go with that. The reason I, I, I say this is, this is the editorial from uh, Alex Kudiko, uh, uh this month in European Urology, where he questions this whole renal ischemia time exercise. And it's, it's great to see that all of a sudden, after 10 years of uh, trying to just share your findings and, uh, uh, you know, being questioned and, and uh, you know, occasionally ridiculed and whatnot, uh, all of a sudden, it, it has been acknowledged as, as a seminal work uh, in terms of on, in, in, on this topic. And, and, the, and the only reason I, I show this is not to pat myself on the back, but to just share with you that sometimes it just takes a long time for things to sink in, for other people to do the work that you did and build on that work and show the same findings that you showed. And I'm just lucky that uh, this happened in 10 years but sometimes it can take two, three, four decades, and sometimes it will never happen. But I think there's still satisfaction that we try to do our best work and, and try to eliminate as many biases as we could and publish up our results, whatever they are, and, and let it take the life of its own in the end. So with that, I'll end. And thank you very much again for the opportunity, uh, Jim, and I uh, look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Ben, that was great. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, kind of the, the elements of your talk. Uh, you know, Dr. Walsh used to always say that uh, uh, I think this had to do with nerve sparing. They, first, they say, I don't believe you. Second, they say, uh, I can't make it work. And then third, they say, uh, we knew it all along. So, uh, so I think that parallels all the, the very nice things that you showed even way back then. So, so depend, you know, you mentioned kind of for the trainees and uh, you certainly had a very, um, a meteoric rise and taking on more administrative responsibilities running the University of Miami Health System. So, so what kind of advice can you give our, our trainees at their, uh, both the resident and, and fellow level and junior faculty? Sure. So I have two pieces of, uh, it's not an advice. I'm not, <laughs> I've not reached a point in my life where I can give advice, but I can just share what I think worked for me. And this is what I share with my faculty, my residents and fellows. Uh, two things come to mind. Number one, uh, sacrifice short-term gratification for long-term greatness. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, I realized you could, you could do, you know, different people do different type of work. And sometimes, uh, you know, that has much more. So if you investigate a, a Medicare database or if you investigate an, uh, uh, you know, NCDB database or you do retrospective studies and stuff like that, it's easier to publish that. Uh, because it's just the data is available and stuff and, and all those things. And so as a resident or as a fellow, you can do that because you have very limited time. But when you are, when you start into academics uh, as a faculty, I think sometimes people get very seduced by some of the perks of academics in terms of being invited for meetings, 
being on the podium to moderate sessions, give talks, and so on and so forth. And once you realize that some of the things that you do in terms of short term that get, gets you that notoriety, you become a victim of that, and you will never be able to produce your best work that could possibly take some longer time. So, you know, perhaps you could, I just want to say quality over quantity, that sometimes, you know, I've done, I mean, I've written about close to 150 papers, uh, but if you ask me what I'm most proud of, it'll be this ischemia study, the RAISER trial, the 4K score, I can just name maybe two or three things. And the others, uh, they're all great, uh, but this, uh, they're all good and all, but I don't even remember them, what I've done myself. But there are just two or three things that I remember that I'm proud of. And hopefully in the next 20 years, I'll be able to do one or two more things. So I think quality over quantity is something that I would suggest. That's number one. Number two, none of my other things that have happened. So as the chief clinical officer, as the CEO of the entire health system, as the executive dean for clinical affairs, as the chair of urology, getting an institute, I did not plan for any of those things. All I focused was on my today. And if you do your best job today, you automatically will be asked to do jobs other than what you do by people because there are not that many people who do their best job every single day. So I have never ever aspired or, or, or planned my career or lived my life in terms of trying to go for titles. I would just focus my best on the job at hand on the day that, on the things that I'm doing today. And if you do that, I think automatically you are sought after by people uh, who are far more uh, uh, influential and powerful than you to step up and do the work. So I think those are the two things that I would like to share, Jim. Thanks, Stephen. That's great. Stephen, I have a quick question for you just regarding the studies you've showed. A really, a really nice talk. So I guess my first question is, how do you explain this? So the kidney is an end organ. It has a solitary blood supply and it has highly metabolic cells that require oxygen. So how, how do we explain, is it the, the fact that there's venous unclamping and we get some oxygenation through the vein or are they just more resistant cells than we ordinarily would think so? Yeah, so Doug, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer of how to explain. All I know is that you know, in, at the time of the study, I worked with two gentlemen who are pioneers in the field. One guy, his name is Venkata Chalam, uh, and you can look up at his studies in 60s and 70s, actually, in rabbit models, in rat models, in many uh, animal models that he has done this work. He was in San Antonio, and the other person I worked with is a guy called Joel Weinberg from University of Michigan. Both of them have done some really extraordinary work in the, in the animal side for a long period of time, and they always suspected that, that kidney cells, are far, human kidney cells, are just inherently far more resistant to, uh, to ischemia, especially when they're healthy to begin with. And, uh, and it's just that we, in our field, and Doug, you saw, it was just based on that one table. There is no, that table cannot be traced anywhere. So we just decided in our mind, uh, based on that one table and that hypothermic article, that the 30 minutes. So imagine, Doug, instead of that 30 minutes, if Andrew Novick had written 60 minutes, then the gold standard would have been 60 minutes. So I think this whole narrative of more or less resistance is because of this, this time limit of 25 or 30 minutes is imprinted, imprinted in our mind. If that time limit was 60 minutes, no one would be talking about renal ischemia. So I think that the narrative is just based on the, this imprint that we all have based on these previous studies. But I think the inherent baseline of a kidney, a normally functioning kidney, is in my mind about 60 to 60 minutes to 90 minutes, if you ask me. Uh, it's just that we, because we behave, believed in that previous study, we, we are fixated on a 30 minute interval. But with that said, anytime you have a baseline CKD, it goes crazy when there is ischemia. So you're right. If that kidney, if that renal function, if that function is compromised because of pre-existing CKD, and then you subject these patients to ischemia, the the detrimental effects are exponential, not incremental. So, so, so Depen, uh, just um, trying to get some advice from you in terms of the, the RAISER trial and your, your takeaways from uh, clinical trials is, as you kind of know, you, you know, as we're doing some of these studies, it never kind of turns out how you, you planned it. And so can you speak to uh, 
randomized clinical trial design and uh, adjusting on the fly as you had to do for the RAZOR study as well? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And actually, you know, maybe in the future, I'll, I'll come back and share with you. You know, I gave a talk at the SEO this year to the young urologist section on uh, design of surgical trials. And I better cover all these nuances and topics. So I think the advice I have is not the advice, but what I would suggest is, Jim, uh, you know, the, the enemy, so basically if you were to choose, you're, you're making a decision of doing a, an imperfect surgical trial, but a trial that will be done versus a perfect trial that will never be done. So there is never ever a perfect trial. There's always a trial that you do and you wish that you had done something else. But then there are always many trials that you try to achieve perfection and that you just don't end up accruing. So that's one thing that I'll say is don't try to do a perfect trial. Try to do the best trial you can to answer that endpoint. That's the most important thing. If you, if you're designing a trial, so you're doing the, the prostatectomy trial, for example, with the red sea sparing of the hood or whatever you're doing, if you are doing that, and if you're answering your primary endpoint, to me, that's a mark of a successful trial. That trial is not going to answer all the questions in the surgical management of prostate cancer. But if you're just going to answer that one question, then, then you've done a great job, I feel. Uh, I, you know, and, and then there's logistics. You, know, you need unlimited amounts of money to do a perfect trial. So I'll give you an example with the RAZOR trial, that one of the things uh, was that pathology review. Now, if I have 15 academic health systems, I really don't think I need a centralized pathologic review. These are all state-of-the-art, great medical centers uh, that you know, you, you know, they publish regularly. I'm, I was very comfortable in eliminating that one step uh, on purpose to make sure that you try to be more practical and pragmatic about getting things accomplished. So that's another example that comes to mind. So I would say that that's what I would do. And, uh, and again, I'll give you an example. When we did the study, it's, it, uh, the other advice I would give is that just make sure that when you do the, uh, you know, have data safety monitoring committees in your trial, have uh, uh, audits, periodic audits of your trial and your study, because that's critical. I mean, I just had one computer glitch uh, in the Razor trial, uh, especially when it come to, came to the margins between the robotic and the open arm. And, uh, and, and we realized that that erroneously attributed high positive margins to the, to the robotic arm compared to the open arm. But as soon as we did the audit, we picked up on that. So it's very, very important once you get the data to attest and validate the quality of the data. So I would say that that would be my top, top uh, focus and priority uh, that rather than making the perfect trial, whatever you have, make sure that that data is really accurate. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Dr. Preet, thank you so much for that great talk. My name is Jerry Wong. I'm one of the urologic oncologists in Queens. And if I remember correctly, is there a possibility that this was presented as a plenary session, your biopsy study in 2008 or 9? It was is a plenary in 2010 or 11, yes. Okay, it, it, it made a very big impression on me because um, I remember this. And I remember thinking a couple things. One was how rigorous uh, the study was in terms of the biopsies, the quantity, and how you uh, analyze the tissue afterwards. But I think more importantly, I wanted to let you know, it made a big impact on me early on in my career um, to kind of just, you know, there's such a focus sometimes on clamp time, um, almost as kind of like a competitive, you know, um, my clamp time is better than yours. And, and, and again, it's not that there may not be something there, but that, you know, I think you have to remember the other goals of the surgery. Um, and um, so I think it gave me confidence also um, early on when training residents that, you know that during certain parts of the procedure, um, it may add a little bit of clamp time uh, if you allow them to do some of the suturing um, in the repair. But I think that that is part of the balance of what we do. You know, you have to be able to do that, uh, even if maybe it means a minute or two or whatever of, uh, more of clamp time, that you also do have multiple things you need to do. Um, and so it kind of gave me the courage to, to, to perhaps have longer clamp time, but to, you know, have the residents potentially be more involved in the uh, repair. Um, I, I think one other thing also that, that Doug brought up, you know, I wonder also if our limitations in these studies, you know, sometimes it's just because we don't have a good enough marker for kidney function. You know, I think that when you do studies in patients who are healthy with two normal kidneys, um, 
we may, I don't think our markers are sensitive enough sometimes to pick up um, uh, subtle changes when there's so much reserve, you know? And I think that um, certainly when I think about clamp time, um, I, I do sometimes vary it based on kind of like, as you said, what's most critical is the baseline function and the baseline parenchyma that they're coming in with. Because I think that has a pretty big impact. Yeah, no, thank you. I think, you know, uh, first of all, I really appreciate your comments. If, uh, you know, in the course of your career, if you, you can positively impact one person, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, what else can you ask for? I mean, we live and die for that. And so I really, really appreciate your comments. I like the fact that you, you realize the value of uh, not going crazy. I mean, you should just go to a operating room uh, that, that believes in clamp versus non-clamp and you'll see two totally different type of operating rooms. One operating room will be will have a calm demeanor, uh, very smooth, efficient, no one's panicking. And the other operating room is from the time you clamp, this is hysteria, craziness, people pre-place all their needles in the abdominal cavity. It's like literally it's like a life and death scenario in the, in the, uh, in the operating room. And you just laugh at, uh, at that. I mean, look, I've done more than 6,000 robotic surgeries. I do on an average close to 100 partial nephrectomies at least over the course of a year. And uh, I would welcome any of one, any one of you to come and watch it in terms of, uh, you know, even the most complex ones that you do, generally the ischemia times are fine. They are always, most ischemia times are literally between 10 to 20 minutes, 90, I would say 95%, maybe 5% of cases every year. And because we do all complex cases, your clamp time is between 25 to 30 minutes or 35 minutes or something. And, and it, it really does not matter. It really does not. Hi, Dipan. This is Larissa Rodriguez. Nice meeting you. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, I had one question. I know you, your cohort, you followed at a year. Have you been, have the opportunity to follow the cohort later on? Because, you know, there's difference between acute changes that you might detect versus yeah, chronic that's changes. That's, that's one question. And the other one, I am not an oncologist. I don't do partial nephrectomies, but you know all these studies. Clearly, people think uh, um, clamping is important. There's always a limit, like a ceiling. Do anybody know where that ceiling is? Yeah. So first of all, congratulations, Teresa, on you. uh, on your new gig. Uh, I'm sure that you're going to do wonderful things for for a while, Cornell. Uh, <clears throat> so the second, I'll answer the the second question first. It is uh, you know the ceiling. So in our study the patient with the longest ischemia time was 61 minutes and that patient did just fine. So I'm not suggesting that on the end of one, I'm suggesting 61 minutes, but I think, and that fits into Doug's earlier question. I, if I had to think based on our study, I think it's around 90 minutes or more, if you ask me, but again, it's purely conjectural. But again, how many times do you do a partial nephrectomy? Even if you were to do the most complex partial nephrectomies, do you ever anticipate your ischemia time to go at 45 minutes or one hour or two hour and a half or something like that. If, if you look at the bell curve, I would say 99.99% of all partial nephrectomies that we do will be within the 10 to 30 minutes uh, of the bell curve. And then there'll be some two to three sigma variations of some outliers one somewhere. But you know, Larissa, the point is, is sometimes in academics, we lose sight of the major distribution and we try to focus all our energies on the outliers and the juice is really not worth the squeeze in these type of patients. So that's the, that's my, uh, that's the answer to the second question. And what was your first question? If you had a chance to follow that same cohort later oh, yes, on, yes, I know yes. you followed it a year, so, but if no, you had no, a that's chance. a great question. So, so Larissa, this patient population was in San Antonio, when I was in San Antonio and many of these patients actually came from South Texas at the border of South Texas and uh, United States and Mexico. And we were able to follow them up for one year, one full year. But right after that, I came to Miami. And so there was no one to continue to follow these patients. Uh, but again, I, I, I'm very comforted by the Cleveland Clinic study because there it was actually more than a year. It was almost 18 months to two years, in some cases even more than that, where those patients who had partial nephrectomy and then they had a radical nephrectomy. So that time was significantly longer and they did not see any differences as such. And I really think about it, you know, you see this, if you do a cystectomy or if you do a big RPL and D and you round on a patient post-op day one, so many times you're low urine output, you give them boluses, 
their kidney function, their creatinine has gone up by the baseline. Let's say baseline is one, it was 1.2. If you really truly apply the AKI definitions, all these patients have AKI. So these are surgical AKIs that bounce back with one normal bolus of a liter of normal saline. These are different from patients with burns, patients with endotoxic shock, critically ill patients, um, you know, those with uh, uh, suprarenal aortic clamping, completely different patient population. We are just fortunate that less than 1% of our patient population truly will end up being on dialysis or something like that in a solitary kidney setting. So again, the entire field, and I know you come from a place that is a big believer in zero ischemia and doing a lot of uh, things that I think are crazy. And I've told this to Indy on his face that uh, many of the, the things that he does, uh, they look very heroic surgically, but I just think they're not necessary. Uh, and so uh, that's the way I think about this subject. Thank you so much. Really, it's been uh, it's a great talk and a pleasure to have you, really. Thank you, Liz. And, and we look forward to, now that you are on our coast, we look forward to having many of you uh, down in Miami. I also want to tell you that uh, we are very fortunate to have the, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, of your superstars from graduated from Cornell as a part of our faculty. As all of you know, Ranjit Ramasamy, he has been a force in terms of men's health and male infertility. And we have Nick Hauser, who does reconstructive urology, who also trained from Cornell. And, uh, you know, it's a powerhouse of a program. And uh, look at all your graduates that are, you know, very good friends with Steve Borgin, Jay Raman, Dan Barocas, many of your superstars from the past uh, who have done great things in their, in their career. So uh, thank you so much. I feel honored and humbled to, to be asked to come and share my experience here with you. Japan, thanks so much. Uh, keep an open mind. We have a lot of residents that uh, like Miami as a destination. So uh, we'll remind you. Fortunately, this is on video. We'll remind you of that comment. Absolutely. All right. All right. Great to see you as always. Take care. Thank you. Take care, Devin. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye.